basis of equality and anti-discrimination legislation are conceptions of justice. The meaning of justice, however, is not absolute, and it requires some unpacking if it is to be understood. Now, in unpacking the conception of justice, we begin with three questions, all of which impact how we view and thus how we pursue equality. What is justice? Who is justice owed to? Who can make justice claims? We begin with what is justice? From a legal perspective, justice is defined in a very specific way, parity of participation. Now, it's built upon notions of human rights and the equal moral worth, the equal dignity of all individuals. Justice thus requires the establishment of social arrangements that facilitate the equal participation of all individuals in social life. Now, when speaking of social life, we consider three spheres the economic, the cultural, and the political. Within the parity of participation definition of justice, injustice manifests as obstacles to equal participation. Injustice in the three spheres is different, though many aspects are overlapping. We begin with economic injustice. Economic injustice occurs when people are denied access to the resources they require to interact with others on similar levels. These resources may include education, housing, food, compensation. Economic injustice, or maldistribution, as it is termed, is not experienced merely because some people have less than others, but because having less than others can ultimately undermine their ability to participate in social life equally. Cultural injustice is rather similar. A society that overvalues a particular cultural group ultimately precludes others from enjoying or expressing their culture on equal terms. They are denied equal standing within the hierarchy of cultural value. For instance, sanctioned religious holidays that are common to most jurisdictions often favor one religious group over others. What this amounts to is an inequitable form of cultural celebration. Cultural injustice or misrecognition results not simply from a refusal to celebrate the faith of others from the implications. The practitioners of one religion come to be more celebrated than the practitioners of another. Finally, we have the political sphere. Struggles over the economic, struggles over the cultural, inevitably play out in the political sphere. The political dimension of justice establishes who is permitted to participate in debates over distribution and debates over recognition. Let's take migrants, for example. In most nation states, until they acquire permanent residency, migrants are usually precluded from voting. In this way, they are prevented from participating in debates over distribution and over recognition. If the standard of justice is parity of participation, we must necessarily conclude that migrants suffer from a form of political injustice or misrepresentation, in that they are excluded from the circle of those entitled to make claims for a just distribution or for reciprocal cultural recognition. Now, of course, there may be valid reasons for choosing to deny migrants voting rights. We may, for instance, decide that it's important for them to inhabit a particular region for a minimum amount of time so that they have opportunity to acquire an adequate understanding of the political structures in place before obtaining the right to influence the outcomes. The misrepresentation they suffer, however, does not abate because of these reasons. Until they pass the established threshold, their voices in electoral terms are not heard. In other words, they do not enjoy parity of participation. Now, our answer to the first question, what is justice, parity of participation, necessarily impacts our answer to the second question, who is justice owed to? If justice is parity of participation, the question can be reformulated then as who is owed parity of participation. Within a liberal democratic framework, the answer is the citizen. While most liberal democracies are denoted by distinct statuses, we have landed migrants, we have refugees, we have asylum seekers, we have permanent residents, we have citizens. Once the citizen threshold is crossed, they become full members of the political community. 
and a full member of the political community is presumed to obtain the same rights as every other full member of the political community, meaning every other citizen. It is the state who must ensure that citizens enjoy parity of participation, and it is citizens who owe this parity of participation to each other. In a globalized world, however, the answer is not as clear cut. Now, we have established an integrated global economy. This global economy is denoted by transnationalized production, outsourced jobs, we have race to the bottom pressures on labor, we have executive mobility. And what this means is that national economies, and by extension nation states, are no longer the most logical adjudicator of justice claims. Corporations and investors who manage the structures of the global economy, and therefore influence the economic, the cultural, and the political, possess a remarkable ability to avoid the regulatory power of nation states. Let's take Amazon, for instance. Amazon is registered in Luxembourg. Its products are stored in warehouses across Europe and, in fact, across the world. Email and telephone communications originate from help centers, primarily in Delhi. The CEO lives in California and Oregon and Hawaii. Members of the boards of directors are located in a dozen countries, and it is listed on three different stock exchanges. Amazon is a fully transnationalized corporation. Now, workplaces, as we have said before, are critical spaces within which justice claims are made. Yet what is unclear is which regulatory framework Amazon operates within. The laws and social processes that affect the lives of Amazon workers, of Amazon customers, of Amazon directors, extend well beyond British borders. Is a customer service agent working in London owed the same level of justice as a customer service agent working in Delhi or working in Beijing? What about customers in different locales? Which consumer protection laws are in force? Are any consumer laws in force since all of these transactions are taking place via the World Wide Web? The answer to our second question, while historically clear, citizens, is now murkier than it was before. But answering this second question requires us to consider the third question. Who are justice claims made against? Corporations, such as Amazon, are private actors. And in many jurisdictions, anti-discrimination laws are limited to public institutions. Now that made sense historically, because the nation state was all powerful. During the neoliberal era, however, the role of the nation state has changed. If we look, we see much in the way of government outsourcing, and we see much in the way of privatization. And this makes the issue of the liability of public institutions a little thornier. A state agency that contracts out some services to a private service provider. And let's say this private service provider infringes on the parity of participation of one of its customers or one of the state's citizens. Can the state be held accountable? Even in certain jurisdictions, such as the UK, where anti-discrimination laws apply to private actors, such as Amazon or the private service provider, which laws are relevant and who can make the claim? What we observe then is a type of breakdown in how we understand justice claims. One way of navigating this confusion is to bifurcate justice claims, to split them. And we split them between first and second order questions. First order questions consider issues of substance. What does justice mean in terms of economics? How much economic inequality is permissible? How do we understand mutual cultural recognition? What does fair representation look like? Now these questions are certainly difficult to answer, but they have been dealt with before, and as we have learned, they are largely dependent on the context and circumstances in which they are posed. Second order questions focus more on process. First order, substance. Second order, process. When asking process questions, what we are concerned with is the frame in which justice claims come about. Who are the relevant subjects? Who are claims made against? Who can make claims? These questions have also been dealt with before, but they were dealt with in a distinct political era, one in which the nation state was the primary actor. That framework has changed, and as a result, answers to these second order questions must necessarily change as well. 
We take, for instance, a bill that was debated in the Canadian Parliament just a short while ago. This bill would have required Canadian corporations to abide by Canadian human rights standards when operating beyond Canadian borders. So we have a Canadian corporation, we have Canadian legislation or Canadian human rights standards, and then we have operations, economic operations that are happening beyond Canadian borders. And what this bill, had it passed, had it become law, what it would have done would have been to compel these corporations to apply Canadian standards in their operations beyond Canadian borders. What MPs were trying to do, the MPs at least who were pushing the bill, was to adjust the frame in which the debate was taking place. And rather than leave it to the whims of the global economy, they said, let us leverage the power of the nation state while accounting for the transnational character of the economy to ensure that certain minimum human rights standards are met wherever Canadian corporations operate. Now, the bill ultimately died in Parliament. But it does make clear to us that there are new challenges to the pursuit of justice or the pursuit of parity of participation or the pursuit of equality in a globalized or a transnationalized world. Now, I'll conclude with a brief summary. Anti-discrimination law is rooted in notions of justice. The one that tends to dominate liberal democracies is parity of participation. Now, justice or parity of participation attends to three spheres, the economic, the cultural, and the political. An obstacle to the enjoyment of parity of participation in any one of these spheres amounts to injustice. Of course, injustice in one sphere can have flow-on effects that will negatively impact the enjoyment of parity of participation or equality in other spheres. If we take, for example, homelessness. Some people inhabit mansions and other people inhabit the streets. There is a form of inequality between these two people. But both of them have the right to vote. On its face, it seems that homeless people suffer from maldistribution, but they do not suffer from misrepresentation. But someone who is homeless, do they enjoy the same opportunity to participate in political debate? Their homelessness negatively impacts their ability to participate in these political debates. So maldistribution can lead to forms of misrepresentation. Without a political voice, it is difficult to articulate or defend your interests. This exacerbates your ability to enjoy equality or parity of participation in both the economic and cultural spheres. What we have then is a vicious circle whereby orders of injustice are continuously reinforcing. Each one acts to deny people the opportunity to participate on par with others in social life. In a transnational world, the debate becomes even more complex. As the subjects of justice claims and their antagonists, or those who make justice claims against, are blurred. We are forced to become creative in our development and application of nation-state-based legislation in a world where economic and governance structures have become supranational. What the supranational governance economic structures what impact they will have on justice, what impact they will have on anti-discrimination legislation, what impact they will have on our pursuit of equality remains to be seen or remains to be decided. Thank you.